Good evening to all of you online and especially here at the IBM Innovation Center in Foster City, California. We have about 10 or 12 people here from different industry stakeholder groups, if I can say so, within 10, 12 people, but there are plenty of different groups represented here. And we are really delighted to have Mike Borton of Grid to Home present an update on Smart Energy Profile. This has been a topic of uh, tremendous interest in different stakeholder groups for the last three, four years as the subject of Smart Grid has taken front and center stage. And the main reason for that is that this is the part that allows customers to engage with the infrastructure, whether with utilities, with aggregators, with state and federal agencies, with energy markets. There's so many domains of the smart grid that can have a potential integration point with customers using smart energy profile. And with the use of smart energy profile, you can enable demand response applications. <clears throat> the reason why demand response is becoming so important now is that we are facing two challenges at the same time. We are seeing the demand for electricity become increasingly more peaked during certain times of the day, like in the morning and towards the late afternoon, early evening. And we're also seeing the retirement of many centralized power plants. And new power plants are not being commissioned at the same rate because we are encouraging people to produce electricity through distributed energy resources. That would be like solar and wind and biofuels and other ways. The challenge with distributed energy resources is that their availability may not be consistent all across the day. So if those peak <laughs> demand periods are associated with lack of supply of these distributed energy resources, demand response becomes very important. This is not just about controlling a couple of events in a year. This will become the mainstay. We will have to tailor our collective demand for electricity so that the shape of that matches the availability of distributed energy resources. And so smart energy profile is going to be a key enabler because what it does is that it allows you to have very granular control over device functions in the customer premise. And by having that granular control, you can shape the load or the demand for electricity while keeping in mind the comfort, safety, reliability of those homes for customers. And so you could potentially create a win-win situation where you contour the shape of electricity to match the resources, but you're not causing too much problems for the day-to-day -day lives of the consumers. This was not possible when we were offering signals with pagers or radio signals turning things off and until the event was over, the customer couldn't do anything. Today, with Smart Energy Profile, with this override capability or choosing certain devices over other devices, you're giving more choice to the customer. What is the net result of that? More acceptability of the technology. More acceptability means distributed energy resources can become a larger and larger percentage of the overall energy mix. So today, if we are, let's say, in the 5 to 7% of overall energy consumption, this could go into the teens and 20s. And this will be very important if we're going to have affordable electricity going forward and maintaining a good standard of living in industrialized societies. So I can't tell you how important this is. Industrial and commercial sectors have been participating in demand response programs for years, but that's because they have people, professional people, who through emails, pagers, and other ways are communicated to, and then they take corrective action. In homes, you don't have that luxury all the time. You don't have a person specialized in energy management at all times. So the need for automation is important. And this is why the residential sector, which carries about a third of the overall load, is a key enabler 
for an energy future that's stable and reliable. So with this little background on the macro picture, I will now turn to Mike Borton, who has been involved with the Zigbee Alliance, with the development of Smart Energy Profile, the whole transition from 1.0 to 1.x to 2.0. So the equivalent of this would be that if I were running a seminar on floods, and you know probably Prophet Noah was there to give a talk on floods, that's kind of like how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> so Mike, with that prophetic description, let me pass the ball to you and uh, introduce yourself and let's get going. Good evening, everybody. I hope it's not too late where you are. I'm going to try and complete this in 45 minutes and then we're going to have a Q&A session that uh, will hopefully will last until we've answered all the questions. Um, so um, I'm going to go into full screen mode and hope that everybody can see the screen. Um, if uh, you have a problem, then please uh, send us a message and we've got someone monitoring. Okay. So I'm going to give an overview view of what is called Smart Energy Profile 2.0. And as you can tell from 2.0, there was a 1.0. 1.0 was derived from something called Zigbee Pro, which is a command and control type of protocol. It wasn't very scalable um, and it wasn't IP based. And so when they started to look at this in a serious way with about the smart grid, and I'll give you some history to start with, then they decided to rework what was Zigbee 1.0 into a Zigbee 2.0. And the real big driver behind that was to become IP-based. It gave the scalability of the whole situation. And just an example within pg e in this territory where we are residing today in this office, there are five million customers each with our multiple devices in the home, so you really do need to have something that's scalable if you want to control individual devices. Okay. Page down? Mm -hmm. How do I get it to go down? Return? Doesn't want to go down. Yeah, there's a horizontal arrow if you bring the thing menu down. And yeah, those are the pages that get moved. Oh, okay. Well, let's do it that method. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On to page two. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm a, a co founder of the company called Grid to Home. Um, we were actually created as a startup actually just to exploit Smart Energy 2.0. So we've been involved from the beginning. I'm a pretty in big industrial veteran of the communications industry, really not the utility industry. So I come from a comms background. And when we raised venture money to do that, we actually went to someone who understood communications and not the utilities. So it really is a communications uh, funded company. Um, I w used to work for TI, uh, Agilent, Act Turner, and I, as you can tell, I'm a Brit, came from the UK and worked in all the big players in the, in the U UK. Um, I basically uh, got a communication engineering degree, so I'm thoroughly just a boring communications guy, really. So page three. So what we're going to talk about... Uh -huh. Sorry, That's all right. Good morning. Uh, good. In the introduction, we're going to talk about what is the smart grid from my perspective. You ask 10 people what the smart grid is about, and you're going to get 10 totally different answers. But I'm going to give you my view, and I've extracted some pictures of the SGIP done, so it might help you there. And the focus of, of our conversation is really about residential customers and these home devices. And residential customers does include small home, small office, Soho type arrangements, and small sort of strip mail places. So it's meant for single meter use where you're controlling devices. Um, I'll give you an introduction to SEP2 very briefly. I'm not going to do a deep dive into SEP2. It would take a week of training for you to understand on SEP2. It's, very, it's uh, highly uh, technical, and I'll show you some reasons later for that. And if anybody's interested in that, just contact me, and I'll, we can arrange a longer session on that. 
I'll talk about some of the market drivers behind that. Some of those have been touched on by Irfan, but I'm going to go and talk to you a little bit more about what those might be. And then finally, how the customer is going to participate, because at the end of the day, we want participation from the customers in the residential premises, and that's really important. Um, without doing that, we're not going to have any hope of doing what we want to do. And then for the technical people, this is the last slide of the whole session. I'm going to talk some of the technical issues that were and challenges that were involved in generating this protocol. So it gives you a, a balance to having a sort of boring marketing stuff versus technical stuff. Slide four. So what is a smart grid from my point of view? So it's a two-way communication, data communication system that's sort of overlaid, overlaid on the grid. And its purposes were to try and save energy reduce cost, increase reliability and transparency, and enable new applications and markets. And we'll see later what those sort of new applications could be. And this smart energy protocol was um, uh, specified, or re the requirements were, that it was to work over any physical layer that's possible out there, really, in the, that's present in the home today. So you think you've already got Wi-Fi, so it should run over Wi-Fi. You've already got Ethernet in the home, you should run on Ethernet. It also it was started in Zigbee because Zigbee has some advantages over those two devices, and it's extremely low power. So for battery-operated devices, you might think, hey, that's strange. Why would we try to save energy on the battery-operated devices? There are some battery-operated devices controlling one of the largest loads in your home, potentially, and that's your air conditioning unit. Some um, older fashions um, thermostats never had the both sides of the pair of the power going to them. So actually, when you go and buy a thermostat from you know Home Depot, you'll find there's an option there to install batteries because you might not have power to that device. It used to be just a mercury tilt switch, just returning power. So there's one of the challenges. You've got some battery operated devices. Slide five. So where did all this start? And why, you know, what happened? Why did it? Uh, why did we suddenly have this smart grid? And you know, why was the home one of the focuses? Well, there was the Energy Act of 2007 passed, and I put the highlights in here. But the green bits really the ones that really come out to me about what the why the customer is going to get involved. And if you, if you read them there, there's the deployment of smart technologies for real time and automation, basically. Interactive technologies that can do this without any intervention by the consumer. It was the integration of those appliances and consumer devices into the electric grid, too. It was deployment of integration of electrical storage and peak shaving technologies. Peak shaving is what's known for these peaks that have been talked about, where actually what we're doing today, if you think about it, as these peaks grow every year, because they do, because we keep it buying more electronics, we build a power station. Traditionally, that's what we've been doing. But you know, that peak might last for 15 minutes in the year. So you could buy a power station, you build a power station for 15 minute use. So you imagine the cost of that energy at those peak times is huge. So peak shaving is very important. And we're going to see a lot more things like electric vehicles coming on. There's probably enough power in the grid to support electric vehicles because Overnight, you can imagine, you can't just shut down a power station overnight. So what happens to all that energy that was generating during the day? I know we have, we have distributed energy resources like solar coming on, which just generate during the day. But actually, we've got wind that comes at night, and we've got all this coal and this nuclear and all this gas and this stuff that actually can't be shut down overnight. So what do you do with that energy? Well, sometimes they just dump it places. And in fact, there are some utilities that will pay you, us, to take energy at night time. It's the reverse. Instead of buying it, you're actually paid to take it. And we do things like pump water back up hills, which might seem a bit crazy, but during the day when we need that energy, we let it flow back down that hill and it runs a turbine and creates energy. So that's a form of storage. And it really is a pretty efficient storage, but unfortunately where we've got energy shortages, which is in the hottest places, we tend not to have that much water to spare. So that's one of the challenges. Um, and then, then the last criteria that's always looked at is the consumer, if he's given information, always makes better decisions about consumption of energy. 
You might have a refrigerator sitting or a freezer sitting in your garage today that's got one packet of frozen peas in it, okay, a single packet. And you think, well, that's it, I'll just use it. I'll take the old freezer out and I'll dump it in the garage. You have to know that the <coughs> old freezer is probably consuming as much as all your other appliances in your house can be today because it can be very inefficient. It's probably you could buy a new packet of peas every week to pay for that freezer. So that's the reality of it. And if you were to give people give, if, and they've shown it, they've demonstrated, if you give users information, they actually make big savings. And there's lots of studies being done. And it shows between 5 and 15% of energy can be saved just by educating people and giving them real-time information. So those are the things that would drove these things. So everybody said, and by the way, I didn't read it in there, but the Energy Act says it shall be an IP network. I don't know who lobbied that into the space, but it, it was quite a reasonable thing to ask for, but it actually drove, one of the things that drove Zigbee to go from SE1 to SE2. And then on the custodian of this, the custodian of all these specs and the, the driver be trying, trying to make them all coordinated was given to NIST. NIST is a government body, you might be aware of it, it's National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and it became the custodian of these specs, and they also set up an organization called SGIP, it was represents all the stakeholders and their job was to go out and fill the gaps, understand where the gaps were and fill the gaps. And SGIP now has actually gone for us from you know 1.0 version of it to 2.0 version. It was originally funded by NIST, but now it's being funded by the mem members. It's actually grown to a pretty big enough size. We'll see if it survives, um, but uh, it's gone to a new phase of being really market driven, not by government driven. And I think it was necessary for the government to drive this in the first place, because without someone putting the infrastructure together, I don't think this would have had to happen. And you, you've got to know there are thousands of specifications to make a smart grid. We're talking about one today, but there are lots and lots. Okay. So, by the way, SEP is two is now one of those standards that is in the ca going into the catalog of standards it's called. So if you look at the big picture, and this is, a, is the SGIP's picture of the big network. There's a lot of elements in, in this. And you can, you can guess what they are. There's the markets that um, are where they buy energy on. There's the operations of, the, of, the, uh, of all those to get all this energy in sh down to their house. There's all people called service providers that actually provide those energy in different markets as different structures. And then basically the, from the, the way it's driven in the electricity, you've got generation, which is known as bulk generation. You then transmission, that's high voltage, that's a big pile, as you see. You have distribution, which is getting it down to your street, which becomes medium voltage, by the way. So we start high voltage, we go medium voltage and low voltage. And low voltage is delivered to the customer at the end. Um, and there is, and there are different ways these these are structured by different companies. It's not always owned by one a utility. You think of a utility, but the way the utilities face you, they may only be a distribution company. In Texas, they may only be a transmission company. They may so that each sure that there are lots of people that make up that and companies that make up that that chain. And we're going to talk about this customer end here as you can see there. So this is the customer end. And you can see those left-hand sides of these things feeding into that. And the bit we're going to focus on is in that blue circle. So even at the customer end, there's still the building and the commercial and there's still the industrial. And so as Erfan says, about a third and third, and a third is where the power goes into, the, into this business. So a third in the home, a third industrial, a third into building and commercial. And today, pretty well, the utilities have good arrangements with buildings and industry to save energy when they need to. You can have an aluminum smelter plant. They'll actually ask at peak summer times, they'll pay them to shut down the whole day. They'll pay them as much money as they would have smelted today. That saves a huge amount of energy that goes back into that. There's a lot of standards and build and, and all buildings and commercial buildings just about are forced to having a energy management system so the lights go off at night at the right times and you have coolers at the top that cool it during the night so using energy at cheap times of the night and then those coolers are actually fed don't they, they're fed into the building during the day. So there's been a lot of things that have gone on 
uh, in time to actually help with the building and the in industry. Home has been zero redone energy management. And I like the description that people call this, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. We consume as much energy as we like, as we think there is available. And we complain as soon as there's a blackout, don't we? And then someone's done a terrible job. But if you think about it, it's a pretty hard job for utility to actually be able to do that without any form of energy management going on. Just think about your air conditioning, how it runs. It's random today. so. If we've all got air cons at home, they all come on, off, on and off at, the at different times, don't they, randomly? Because they cycle on, cools the place down, it gets to a cold enough position, and then it turns off and then it ramps back up. But what happens the one day when every one of our air cons are on all the time? That they have to anticipate, and we expect them to have enough energy produced to actually to do that. But what happens if we would coordinate it? You're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. That way, I don't think we'd notice at all about our cooling because we're going to ramp on and off. But we could guarantee then that there's not that random event of all of them on at the same time. And you have to know in California, in the summer months, 60% of the load, residential load, is aircon in California. And we're not the hottest state. Um, Texas and Florida is much higher. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is all the things that go inside the home. And anything with a motor in is a high, high load. Motors, dishwashers, washing machines, tumble dryers, pool pumps, sump pumps, they're all of a load. A one horsepower motor is effectively one kilowatt of energy. Okay, that's effectively, and the average load in a home is around one, one kilowatt anyway in normal operation. So you add all these machines that can come on at the same time, then they can all cause an overload situation and we keep building power plants just for that one day when we have all this situation where they all come on at the same time and that has to change really because it's much more economical to be able to manage these loads than it is to carry on building power stations and we're much better at looking after resources after all which is pretty rare I mean we're consuming all those resources if we were to manage the load rather than managing the generation and it's called demand-side management. That's a term you'll hear, demand-side management. Okay? So, what, now we're getting to what is set to. So, it's a network and application integration platform for messaging between the customer and energy service providers. Okay? It's actually a two-way, it's both ways. Okay. In doing so, when they put the requirements together, the utilities, they were, they were the major stakeholders involved. They, they, there was a couple of things they said. First of all, it needs to be zero configuration. We don't have, if you look at your phone today, you still have to configure things. If you, your average device in your home, if it's connected to some network, someone's configuring it. And the challenge that was given to the SEP tune was zero, it means nothing has to, has to be configured. You have to be able to install a device, it has to find the information, the utility, it has to be able to get that information without any configuration whatsoever. That's quite a challenge in doing so, but, and in fact that's one of the underlying technologies that people don't really see in SEP2, but zero configuration is a really big part of this. And the other one that was a really big part of this was fully secure. There are actually three layers of security you would get through for a, a SE2 device. And the reason behind the security is if you could control enough loads in a network, and you are now an IP network, we just talked about an IP network can be hacked. If you can control a sufficient number of loads and you could turn them on and off at fast enough intervals, you can actually, that inrush current generated by the on and off state can blow up the network. You've just got to be able to manage enough loads. Now imagine we connect 5 million homes just in the pg e territory and turn it on and off. You could blow the network up. And it wouldn't be a blow up that means just a transformer going down. It could be cables, transformers, power stations. Every appliance in your home could go. And so there's a paranoia about controlling that. I don't want to overemphasize this, but it really has to be secure. Because the one problem with IP networks is that everybody likes to hack them, as you know. And there are a lot of scams around too. 
And then the opposite challenge, those are two great things that they wanted in there. They also wanted this to be small and inexpensive. They wanted this to be a $2 device, basically, that goes into, can be attached to anything in like a sump pump or a thermostat, a $2 device. And so th that's quite a challenge today, but, you know, silicon, you can do wonders with it. And if you actually design something with a very specific task in mind, it actually was achievable, and we've got it down to pretty cost-effective designs. And there are, there are people working now on designs that could be less than that cost, could be less than that cost. And then the last thing there that they wanted to attach, attack, which as I talked about before, is have IPV. And they don't, didn't choose IPv4, they went to IPv6. And the reason is we've run out of addresses in IPv4. And these things, they want to be able to totally be addressable. And they wanted it to be physical layer in, independent too. And so they had to use IPv6. To give you an idea how I many IPv6 addresses exist, compared to what the IPv4s run out basically now, and in many countries they've already had to transition to IPv6. There are 16 million IP addresses for every square inch of this planet. So there should be sufficient for us when we reside, when we stay on this planet, because I don't imagine us having more than 16 million devices per square inch of the planet. <laughs> and a high rise you could, but, but that's, that's the opportunity that IPv6 gives. And what does it do? It provides peak load shaving, which we've described before. It's basically cutting those peaks off so that we don't keep building pl power plants just to feed the peak. And it's basically to take that peak and squash it. And it's just really trying to take random events out and what's called a deferrable load, a, a deferring a load until another point in time. You wouldn't notice your pull pump didn't run exactly now and it ran in 10 minutes' time. You wouldn't notice if your thermostat actually came on now and cycled off later. It, you probably, if it, if, it did, if it turned off for 20 minutes, you probably would notice a half a degree, which none of us are going to sense. You don't know if your dishwasher was to actually suspend its cycle for five minutes. Okay? You don't know if your, if your sump pump didn't run for 10 minutes. And in, I'll give you an example. In California, o over 80% of the load, residential load, is what's called a deferrable load. It can be deferred. Okay? means deferred, not hours, but it could be deferred 15 minutes. None of us will notice. So there's no big brotherness about trying to control this and saying you can't run your aircon. It's about trying to defer these loads so that we take this peak and we flatten it and we squash it. Okay? If we can squash it just a small amount every year, then you don't have to build any more new power stations. That's what it means. And the other thing that we talked about was the, the new... And now we're taking all these old dirty coal and we're taking old power stations. And some of these power stations that have been running for 40 years are actually coming, you know, take, being taken down now. We're replacing them with distributed energy resources. That's great. That's being green. It's not really easy. <coughs> but the trouble with a, 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 a solar or a wind is it's here one minute and it can be gone the next. It's called an intermittent energy. And the only way you're going to respond to that is either have a conventional system on standby, which seems a bit crazy, doesn't it? You, so bringing in a, another conventional power system and turn it on, well, why do that? Have two things in parallel. Or you do a demand response event. In other words, you tell equipment, okay, there's a cloud come off, now let's turn your aircons off. Which it would seem reasonable. The heat's gone for a little while, let's turn off a few aircons. And that's what it's all about. And as I talked about earlier, there is a modifying consumer's behavior, and it's not meant to be a brainwashing thing, but people who have got a $500 a month bill, which might have if you live in California, some of the states are okay, but if you may have a big bill here, and actually saving 5 or 10% of a $500 bill because you're given information that doesn't change your lifestyle but helps you make wiser decisions can save you $50 a month. So it's well worth doing. $50 a month is $600 a year after all. Okay. Um, and. The, there is a move, and a lot of people like to do it, is move to real-time or time-of-use pricing. In other words, pay for the energy at the cost it is at that point in time. And get rid of this all-you-can-eat buffet, because someone's gaining something out of that. And it's, it'd be much fairer if we paid for the energy at the, at the cost it was. In other words, I would like to do that, because I could make a huge saving if I defer my energy to when there was a lower cost. So I'm gonna, I would like to take that myself. And then we've got to manage, we want to manage the residential loads and the generation, that's these solar and stuff, and we're going to have a lot of electric vehicles, a lot of renewables and a lot of electric vehicles coming on. 
which have their own set of challenges because electric vehicles, they want range, and they, if they want range, which is the ability to drive more than 100 miles, probably 300 miles, it requires a fair amount of power. Okay. And this standard that we're working on is being supported by other countries too. And um, it's, as you, one country I didn't put down here, and everybody must know that Japan had this tsunami, knocked out all their nuclear power stations. They've only got one back online now today. In the summer, they got a 20% shortfall of energy, which at the moment is done by giving each city, you know, time on and time off for two hours or so. They want to move to DER, so this is all, you know, done automatically, and so they don't have to build any more power stations. So Japan is one of the people actually pushing forward with something like this, and there's actually a competition, I call it the Pepsi Challenge Test, between a local Japanese standard and SEP2 in March of this year. Um, and so Japan is really probably one of the first countries that's really going to be managing residential loads through a two-way protocol. Okay. So what does this network look like? So on the right-hand side of the screen, you've got smart meters. The purpose of a smart meter was just more than just be able to read them remotely, which is all that's been used and why people are getting upset today, because they don't really see any benefit to themselves. Everybody's probably heard of this. There's people who think they're being brainwashed or getting ill from smart meters. They have their own opinion, of course, but I think they're a little crazy, but um, that's their own opinion. But no, no one really sees the benefit for it, so I, I, you know, if I don't understand the technology, I would see a reason to fight it too. I don't need it. But the reason why people deployed smart meters is because we wanted to start managing loads in the home. And that's the enabler for it. It wasn't just about remote meter readings, which is what people perceive the smart meters were deployed for today. So there is the access or the, the, the data coming from the utility will come through the smart meter. Some utilities also said they won't use a smart meter to come through that method. It'll actually come through the internet into the gateway. So the data is coming into the premise from the utility, either through the smart meter or through the internet. Okay. And then they want to be able to, through physical means or through uh, radio means, talk to all these devices. The first big target for utilities, you have to know, is thermostats. Thermostats controls air cons. Aircon represents the largest load in your home today. Electric vehicles will be, but the number of electric vehicles on the road are not don't amount to anything when you add up. Okay, a a uh, aircon is between one and three kilowatts of energy. The average load in the home is about one kilowatt. So every time you turn your aircon on, it's it's already the load for the average for the for an area. The next uh, thing they wanted to be able to manage are things like pool pumps or sump pumps. In California, we have a lot of pools. Every one horsepower of motor, and most pools have one or two horsepower, so you've got another one or two kilowatts of load. Um, and then um, they're interested, by the way, the utilities about reading other meters inside the home. If you've got this access in through the smart meter, maybe they want to read the gas meter and the water meter, because each one of those will save it being manually read. And some utilities run both the electricity and the gas. For instance, PG&E is, is both the gas and, and, and electricity. And then they want to be able to give through a portable display, and portable displays today, by the way, is this device that sits in your pocket, um, want to be able to give information about your energy usage or give you information about your bill or give you information that you can make wise decisions on. So this whole um, network will also connect to your pocket, in, your thing in your pocket, your smartphone. Okay. And then electric vehicles, are a, 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 an opportunity. Energy storage is an opportunity because um, some people are working on that, that your battery or your electric vehicle could be used to power your house at peak times. If we go into real time pricing, midday, the you know at the very peak, the price of energy may be fairly high. And if you added some form of energy storage or a car park at the time, you may prefer to use your energy rather than the utility's energy at that point in time. 
So these are the sort of opportunities that this home area network is there. When SCP was to a design, it was envisioned that for every home there may be 30 devices that will be getting that information. Now, can you imagine the size of this network? There's 120 million units, 120 million homes in the US. There are up to 30 devices per home. So we're talking about billions and billions of units that could be managing energy in the US alone. If you looked at the it worldwide, there are 3 billion meters worldwide. And so this is a, something that's even bigger than your cell phone or the PC market. I know it's only a $2 device, but it's actually a very, very big, large market in terms of units. Okay. We can use the horizontal arrows on the side, on the right side there. This one. Oh, this one. Oh, this one. This thing. Oh, there we are. Save a bit of time. <laughs> okay, so different physical layers. So these are things that people have tried out, and um, there's been interoperability already been going on. By the way, this spec, the status of the specification is basically finished. There's been a lot of interoperability work. There's been, the the utilities are paranoid about um, about deploying something that hasn't been thoroughly tested. And for the last two years, we basically have been trying to get it to work and interrupt with multiple vendors and over multiple physical layers. So 8215.4 radio is what's known as ZigBee, although it's not exclusively used by ZigBee. It's an IEEE standard. It's a wireless PAN, it's a mesh technology. It's very low speed, but it's also very low power, okay? Physical layer. 8211 is what you, everyone knows as Wi-Fi. It's already prevalent in the house, and you wouldn't notice, by the way, Smart energy is probably 10 kilobits worth of data, 10. And you're running your video today around your house, it could be running mega megabits. And so you're not going to notice, it's not going to be hogging any bandwidth to run over your existing network in your home Wi Fi, for instance. Power line communication is also being one of the considered. You might know of a standard called Home Club, or there's actually some, there's an IEEE standard there and uh, an ITU standard that. Uh, is available there running that. And in fact, electric vehicles are going to use a power line standard. The reason why the electric vehicles are using a power line standard is because it's a mobile device. When you arrive at home and you plug in, if you were to use your radio, it might not know where you're plugging in because your neighbor's premise may be closer than yours. You go to a public charge station and you try to plug in and the receiving base station if it was radio would be maybe closer than one you're plugged into just by its very structure. Power line communication the advantage of it is it's traveling down the same power as you're getting charged to the electric vehicle. So you know the location of where you're plugged into automatically. You don't have to have some sophisticated algorithm or some method of someone waggling a key in front of it to show where you are and that's open to fraud. Where you are connected is where you're containing power, where you'll be metered, and where you'll be paying your bill to. So that's why they're using power line communication. Power line communication also has, a, has other advantages. For instance, if you've got a pool pump at the bottom of your yard, which is outside your Wi-Fi range, and everybody mounts their pool houses maybe further from the house, power line communication is probably going to get you to that pool house easier than Wi-Fi or Zigbee is going to get you there. And so power line communication is A, good for electric vehicles, and B, for remote devices, remote places. And some people have got garages that are not attached to the house and maybe away from the house, and there's another good example. It may be out of range of your Wi-Fi of your house, but it would be connected by power line to your home. Other standards are around DECT, Bluetooth, Ethernet, and SEP2 can support any of those. It's really not being defined to use any specific one. You can use any one, and of course, then, if you use have all these, then you're going to have to have some bridging device in your home that bridges all these technologies. So there's a good market for bridging devices. But today, that's called your router in your home, and the router manufacturers are all working to add these multiple standards into the next generation of routers. And so your router that you have in your home for routing also becomes this bridge for all these different technologies. So that's where this that's going. I think uh, one point that can be made is that Mike uh, emphasized how much diligence was paid on cybersecurity for SEP. SEP being an application layer and semantic layer protocol. So the lower layers that we're now talking about 
need to be as secure as that application and semantic layer. Otherwise, you have the example of like a beach house with a big padlock on the front door standing on wooden stilts on the beach. So the thing to do is not to break the padlock. You just take a saw and cut the legs of the house, and it falls, and everything is available to you at that time. So it's very important that you look at all the layers of the stack and put the appropriate security controls in all of those layers because a hacker is not just interested in the application layer if they are into causing trouble. If they want to steal information, yes, then the application layer security is very critical. Yeah. And as I said earlier, there are three layers of security, and they're basically in the three different layers. One is the application layer, one is the transport layer, and one is the physical layer. And they all have different security mechanisms that you must get through to get right to the very top. And I am pretty sure this is not something that's going to be easily broken. But uh, we'll see. There are creative yeah, people. The, all the protocols that are listed don't necessarily support that level of control in all the layers. Mm -hmm. But SCP-2 adds some to them, by the way. So okay. they, 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 the only requirement is that the, uh, the physical layer must have um, some sort of Mac layer security in it. Yeah. And most of those protocols do. So here's some of the drivers behind it. So we talked about some of these already. So the problem is peak energy issues. And this is what peak shaving and intelligent the solution is, is, is peak shaving and intelligent load management. Got new requirements coming on the grid, electric vehicles and renewable generation. We've already talked about that. And again, it's the same sort of solutions being peak shaving and then to shave off the demand when the renewable energy disappears. Rising consumer bills. I don't know if you haven't noticed your bill in PGE, &E, but it raises it rises every year much greater than inflation does. On average, I think it's been six percent, hasn't it? If I, I don't know, it, it it has been I think about six percent per year on average for the last ten years which is much, much greater than the, the level of inflation. So we have rising consumer bills, and it's because we're pay, using in fossil fuels to do so, and the, and the cost of energy goes up. And, uh, and uh, you know, rising consumer energy bills is basically, at the moment, at the end of the month when you get your bill, how do you know where you've used your energy? You have no clue. You can look at your bill, oh, $550, dollars spend that. Oh. And what do we do? Blame the kids. Hey. You left your light on in your room, you've got to turn your computer off. But actually, those two devices are probably not the cause today of high electricity bills. It's more likely to be the old freezer in the garage or someone running their pool pump for too long, something like that. Customer support is the one of the other things. So the zero configuration was one of the things and the robustness built into the spec and all this uh, interoperability testing. One of the things the utilities didn't want to have is a huge custom support issue if we start putting these devices into the home. So there's been an awful lot of testing. Some of the broad market drivers that are going on, this is really nothing to do with the utilities, but the Internet of Things are happening. You must have heard this terminology. Everything's going to be connected on the Internet. And this is just another one of those things and really just adds to the device, but you, in this, what they call machine to machine, which is basically, this is what is, is a machine to machine. It's a generation machine talking to the end demand ma machine that's causing the demand of this energy, and they're actually coordinated together to make the best use of the energy. But we see other things going on in the end to end business. Uh, industrial control, home automation, security, um, health, Home automation, all those things are basically using the same sort of underlying technology. Then from the utilities of the broad market drivers, intermittent renewables, peak demand, electric vehicles, economic. So do you, do you think the utilities are doing this just to say these peaks? It's, it's because the peaks are very costly. It's estimated as much as the top 5% of that peak energy is 50% of the total cost. So it's really essential that it's for them that they're going to save that 5% because that's where 50% of the cost is. Now, most utilities are actually public-driven, public utilities. In fact, what will happen to that 50% saving has got to come back to the consumer. So this is going to be the benefit where the consumer gets it from. And the utilities can probably afford to pay us to replace our thermostats. They'll pay, give you a free thermostat. They'll 
give you incentives to replace your washing machines and tumble dryers, just like they have done in pg and &E territory for a long time on energy efficiency. But for smart energy, it's going to pay them to do that because they'll reduce their costs if they can just shave that top peak off. And if you remember that top peak, because you're sitting there with a power generation that's been built, commissioned, it's probably sitting there spinning, it's called a spinning reserve, it's sitting there waiting to be engaged for the very 15 minutes in the year that says, ah, all the aircons are on, I'm going to engage and generate electricity. So the cost of that energy when you do that has to be amortized over the cost of building that plant operating it, maintaining it, just for 15 minutes in the year. That's why that energy at that very peak time is very costly. Okay, let's go on. So here's some another interesting fact that's really hidden by what's happening. Our energy consumption on what's called a, the margin, in other words, what we generate and what we've got available, is changing rapidly. We still go out and buy all these electronic gadgets. We Add, we consume energy is like we nothing. That green line you see there is the estimation of when that drops below that black line. That black line is what's called the margin. That's the margin above what they must be able. To, they predict they must have to generate the following day. It, as soon as you fall below that margin, there is a very strong chance that a little peak will trip the network. We'll actually have a blackout. The problem with blackouts is they're very hard to recover because to bring back a whole segment, you have high inrush current and you need more energy than what's in the network. And that's why you have a rolling blackout because you force a segment to come up by holding in the cross big relay, but it sucks energy from somewhere else and that trips and then we have a rolling. And you know when rolling stops, the rolling blackout stop? It stops when we've got sufficient energy to bring back the last segment and that's normally at night time that's why you hear rolling blackouts going on for a long time they normally exist until night time when everybody goes to bed turns off all the appliances and then there's sufficient energy to bring back that network because the first few seconds after everybody comes back after a blackout it requires approximately twice the energy of its normal energy usage where does that energy come from if we don't generate it it gets sucked from another segment and if you suck it from another segment, that segment itself trips. And that's how we get the rolling back. And that's why these, you hear rolling blackouts, because that's what it really means. It rolls and rolls and rolls until we've got enough energy in the network to bring it back. And that's night time. And people are going to bed. So these two charts really show what's happening with, with this energy. This green line is where we're going to go. I mean, this is the capacity resource, and it, it shows in 2016. In the summer, we are generally going to be falling below the, the margin requirement. Okay, that's where we are. And you can look at particular different uh, states because actually, there's a. If you go to the FERC website or the NERC website, you'll find these figures. They're published there, and you'll find that that green line changes with different states. In Texas, where they actually uh, brought in a lot of competition, they've actually stimulated a lot of demand. And the challenge with Texas is they have a very co uh, very competitive market now where energy is fought amongst about 30 suppliers. The problem is that they're now running out of energy, as you can see. Um, in theory, next year, Texas could fall below their margin requirement and we could see rolling blackout in Texas. Ontario, Canadian place, as you know, Canada didn't really have such a a bad recession, and in fact, their economy is recovering rapidly in Ontario. They predict that in 2015 that there will be enough recovery in the economy that generates them into the rolling blackout session in 2015. So it's very imminent. So the reason why step two, there's an urgency behind a lot of these utilities, is because there are certain states running out of energy and we're going to go into a rolling blackout. When you go into a rolling blackout, governors lose their jobs. So, uh, and economies suffer and people go backwards. And that's why Obama, when he came in in his first administration, recognized that and actually put $4.3 billion worth of grants into solving some of these crisis areas. And that's a lot of money. And some 18 million smart meters were put in through that, that grant system. 
Yeah, and one of the key things about that is that co-ops and munis for years have had automated meter reading. So these billions of dollars were not spent just to put a bunch of digital meters so we could have remote you know, reading of meters or remote connect, disconnect. Those are very important services. But it's really about what Mike is talking about in terms of controlling customer uh, consumption of electricity during these critical times that will produce the huge dividend, the economic dividend. And there have been studies done by the Electric Power Research Institute, and they're called the PRISM study, in which they show that without addressing energy efficiency and demand response and things like um, renewable energy, what could potentially happen to the cost of electricity. And the investment in these technologies compared to the cost of electricity that could be avoided, the increased cost of electricity, is almost 30 to 1. In other words, for every dollar of R&D that you spend, you would get about $30 of benefit in avoided cost of electricity. So it's a really sweet deal, and that's Obama's investment is like seed investment, but now the private sector needs to get into this in a big way in order to realize the full potential. Yeah. Government support can sometimes give you that crutch so you don't do anything else. That's right. It was necessary to kick it off, though, I think. Yeah. So here's some examples of demand response. Um, smart appliances, uh, your smart appliance, your, your dishwashers, your tumble dryers, you don't really know, you wouldn't really care if the cycle took 35 minutes or 40 minutes. You don't really mind, do you? Actually, you don't even mind if your dishwasher didn't run now, it ran at midnight, as long as the dishes were clear in the morning. But today, when you go to bed at 10 o'clock, you push the dishwasher on, it may not be the optimum time for running that dishwasher. It may be better at 2 a.m. in the morning when there's more energy available, for instance. So people like Whirlpool have announced that all their electronic control appliances sold in 2015 onwards will be smart energy enabled. So you, so you can think of all your white goods in your house. It's possible in 2015 to go out and buy a device. That can move its demand time. You could do it by moving it to when it's the cheapest time to run or doing it on based on the available energy. Um, and in fact, some some things there are some features in step two, such as only running an appliance when there is wind energy, when there's a certain amount of wind energy being put into the system, which is happens more, more or less in a lot of places where the wind is. It picks up in the evening just as the sun goes down, and there's a change of wind that occurs. Ten minutes. Yes, yeah, good. So people like. Uh, Whirlpool are going to do all their appliances, and Whirlpool is pretty big market share. There's like 6% of Whirlpool branded stuff. They own like 15 brands, but they own a lot of the brands that you probably buy. Smart Thermotat is an easy target because it's really basically a $100 device that you can go out and replace. It doesn't require you to have a new aircon system. It requires you to have a new thermostat. It's very cheap to install. It's very easy to install. And even if your grandmother doesn't want to do it, then you can get Best Buy to come and install one at a very cheap rate. I think some of the utilities are planning to give vouchers out that will allow you to go to Best Buy, get a thermostat, and get it installed by them free of charge, and also pay you for doing it towards your bill when a demand response event comes. It's also possible these thermostats can be programmed so you can opt out of these programs so they don't do it. But Typically, you won't even notice. I know people who've had these already installed in trials, and they didn't even notice when it went into a demand response cycle. It's completely transparent to you. Unless you're very sensitive to a half a degree temp temperature change, you're probably not going to notice when a demand response occurred. But it's very important that the demand response can control these devices because it's not the effect of it being necessarily hot. It's the fact that randomly, Three thermostats are on the same time, or all of them are on the same time. That's the problem. Plug-in electric vehicles. Well, we all know it, as soon as we increase gasoline, then everybody goes out and buy the hybrids. And if it, there's some estimates that if we get to ten dollars a gallon, that everybody will go out and buy an EV. By the way, but you can, <laughs> it may be true if we get the cost of EVs down. And, theory, EVs are supposed to be cheaper than combustion engines. They're a lot easier to build and they've got 30% less parts, but today we're paying premiums for the first, you know, rev one of the prototypes. 
and there's an estimate we could probably power the majority of electric vehicles without any increase in the energy and not without building any power plants as long as you charge them at night. There is a local problem with your distribution transformer, but not from the generation capacity side of it. I don't know if you know in the US there's a transformer that sits on your house and there's about five to seven homes that that one transformer feeds. Okay, electric vehicle can look like about four homes at a time. So electric transformer can take a short period of time when it can be overloaded. It's got some heat inertia in it and can feed one vehicle. If a neighborhood come, suddenly decides that all going to buy electric vehicle, then that transformer is not going to survive. It's going to have to replace whether either a dedicated transformer or by a smart enabled electric vehicle that will coordinate when the vehicles charge. There is a case study about that for a utility I will not mention by name, but two people on a block bought a Tesla <coughs> each, and it cost the utility $17,000 to upgrade the transformer on the street to accommodate that. And there's another issue also. You talked about the capacity of the transformer. There's also the issue of the lifetime of the transformer. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain time that you need to have very little power going through that transformer so that it can cool down. And that cooling down process is important for its longevity. So these demand response events are going to be necessary even during the off-peak time to give these transformers time to rest and cool down. Otherwise, we're going to have another issue in the long run. And then here's another opportunity for electric vehicles used to storage, storage the energy. At the average time a vehicle is used is one hour out of 23. The rest of the time is sitting there. You probably only need to have it connected to be charging on the grid for three hours in the future, maybe, you know, even the best case. So for 20 odd hours, that vehicle is going to be sitting there not being charging and not being used. But at peak energy times, you could take a small amount of energy out of that car to power your house. A, you could avoid, if we go into real-time pricing, high, or it could respond to a demand response. And instead of you turning off your aircon, you actually turn on the electric vehicle. It actually automatically came out of the electric vehicle. There's plenty of time to put that energy back in, because as I said, your vehicle is used for one hour at 23, three hours for charging, 20 hours doing nothing. So if you sat there for two hours powering your house, then you've still got 18 hours to recharge again before you need it. So the, the mathematics make a lot of sense. What's stopping the whole industry is the way that electric uh, vehicles are warrantied today. By law, they're warrantied by the number of miles they travel. Okay? You could buy an electric vehicle, take it home, and you could have that battery being charged and discharged and having to be replaced under warranty in five years' time. Never did a kilometre of miles, so the electric vehicle manufacturers are worried about being held to a warranty on a battery if someone were to use it instead of using it for travelling and they were using it. Now there will be products coming on the market, there are products already on the market where you can buy just a standalone battery. In fact, there's a big aftermarket for old Prius batteries for people making homemade um, systems at home for this. But the electric vehicle manufacturers are really worried about it, although they are building test vehicles today to do this feature. I know some of them, there are start trials this year, but it's still a warranty issue. It's simple for me, I think the electric vehicles have to be considered like an aircraft um, motor, which is done by a number of hours in usage, not the number of miles traveled, and then it solves the problem. And you have a warranty for 100,000 hours of usage of your battery, not for 100,000 miles you want to take. But, you know, politics come in the way and that's got to be solved. Now, there, in addition to energy, there are also ancillary services mm -hmm. that are going to be very important. And we have Angela Chang here from EPRI, who is quite an authority on ancillary services, has done a lot of research on it. Ancillary services like bar support are going to be very important with increasing amount of uh, inductive motors. The problem is that you don't get the power factor is not very close to unity when you have things like that. So having VAR support from things like electric vehicles and PVs and wind farms 
are going to be very important going forward. And having the transparency in the process, that's what smart energy profile can produce for us, is that there can be some objects defined in smart energy profile for VAR support. And the utility could find out potentially how much they can count on from commercial, industrial, and residential sectors using this. So whether it be 61850 in a wind farm or a solar farm, it could be smart energy profile in a home, uh, it could be backnet in, let's say, industrial situation. You could get this kind of information, and what it does is it helps you plan better so that you can keep your power factor as close to unity as possible and reduce the amount of loss in the T&D system. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about was um, consumers' desire to lower energy costs, and we've, we've seen through studies that the people who can see how much and when they consume an energy get a 5 to 15 percent, and even that's done very, very crudely today in 15 or 30 minutes or hour intervals over the AMI network, it's called. But with Smart Energy 2, you'll be able to get real-time data. You'll be able to open your refrigerator door, see the refrigerator compressor turn on, and you'll see the instantaneous what the power consumption is of your refrigerator is set to. It'll allow you to connect directly to see what the energy usage is in real time. Today, energy usage is done by the utility accessing your meter, backhauling it to a server, and you accessing it through the web. In fact, most of that is not available to the next day. It's got a granularity of 15 minutes or 10 minutes in some cases, but it takes a lot of processing to do that. And you have to imagine that going around and getting 5 million meters data and sending it back to a server and then processing that and making it available takes a lot of time. With set 2, you'll be able to directly access the meter and get the instantaneous power out of that meter inside your home, maybe on your smartphone. So we think that's got to do. There's an initiative called Green Button that everybody should look at. Really, it's a method. It's a method to put a common for format for everybody into getting real-time data, and therefore you won't have to have an app per utility. You'll actually have a Green Button app, and they do exist already today. And PG&E is already promoting um, a green. You can download your data through uh, what's called the Green Button today, and it's it's data in a sort of a, a common format. An interesting coincidence on your bill. The Chief Information Security Officer of PG&E is James Sample, and the name on this bill is Joe Sample. Is it? <laughs> is it already on PG&E's website? It's, it's a very interesting coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some of the technical challenges that we had when we were developing the product, and this is my last slide, really. So the the cost sensitivity was huge, and Every time we made a decision, we had to think about what the processor power required and the memory footprint was required. <coughs> and that meant that, in some cases, when there was a, an, a spec out there that we could have taken, we actually really had to look at that spec in the, that, that element just to make sure what the impact was, was on the process and the memory footprint. And that meant that re really basically everything was built from ground upwards to make this the most efficient. Today, you could implement SEP2 on something like an, an Apple here. It's got all that functionality in there. However, it uses megabytes of code to run it. It needs a major processor to do it, and it really can't be done for $2. Okay. So when you build this, we wanted to use, we wanted to take a lot of stuff from international standards that were already done, but in some cases, we had to really look at that because the impact on that may have been another two cents or ten cents on the process or the memory footprint and it, and it became a really one of the drivers behind a lot of the choices that we had to make here. Zero configuration, no customer programming, that was quite a challenge until Apple volunteered to come and join the, the specification work group and they contributed their knowledge of Apple Bonjour. I don't know if you know, if you're, if you're any of your Apple users, but you don't have things called drivers to find and load with Apple or you don't have to find where your printer is and load its drivers. Apple has a protocol that they have for many years called Bonjour. It goes out and finds it and configures itself. And we've used that. It's now an IETF standard that's called DNS or MDNS. And it discovers the resources and automatically configures stuff. And uh, without the help of Apple, we wouldn't have got there. But 
where everything went. There's always when something's made simple, there's a lot of complexity below it. And in fact, I would say the largest complexity of set two is not all the messaging and all these schemas that transfers the data. It's actually the, the discovery automatically of the resources and the configurations. Um, interoperability was quite a challenge, and for the last for a year now we've doing, been doing this multi-vending testing, and, and that's just about complete. The state where we are now, the spec is the spec's basically finished, and we've probably got one or two more events to go, and then the first products will come out of the uh, those those first few products, I guess, will be certified. And so, probably within the next three months, we're going to see the first step two products on the marketplace. Security, grid security, and privacy were really quite an issue, and we, there was a lot of effort gone into the the security and a lot of p people contributed from different, even government places came in and helped with that. And the one of the requirements the utilities wanted is that everything should end up in an international standard. There was nothing to be left as being proprietary. The big advantage of putting it into an international standard, it, it can relieve you of a lot of the patent and mm -hmm. infringement issues that get out when you make it a international <coughs> standard. So, the, and the, to do that, you we had to start by using uh, getting a high reuse of the existing standard or a subset of that, and that can avoid a lot of the issues. So they, those are the technical challenges. To give you an idea, this spec and the requirements and everything, and we're not finished yet. It's been a three-year exercise. It might sound a lot, but I've been involved in other standards where they took five years. So, although this sounds a long time, and we did a lot of things, it's actually a pretty short time when you look back on back on it. So those are the technical challenges, but it's re it's really read ready for uh, prime time now. So quick summary: the smart grid meets the consumer in the next year or so. That's the good news. Um, and we can no longer build power plants to supply the peak. That's pretty evident from the cost of all those resources and and energy. And consumers will be able to participate and they'll be able to get rewarded for saving energy, both in their bill and they may even get rewarded for when they participate in some of these demand response events, depending on the utility. And you may get rewarded by getting a free thermostat. I'm not telling you who's promising to do that. <laughs> and, you know, one of the big benefits out of this, if you imagine there is a base load and there's a peak. And if you're a utility, you've got to think about that. You're pretty inefficient if the peak's very high and the base load's very low. The gap between that is your inefficiency. And by doing demand response and all these things, you're actually increasing the efficiency of a business by doing so. And if you could think about this, if we could trot the peaks off and we can fill the troughs in the electric vehicle, we'll be producing what we consume. Because today we're not doing that. We're throwing a lot of energy away. And if we can do that, you're becoming a very efficient business. And in many savings when you do that. I would imagine a utility cannot be any more than 40% efficient today, peak to base. It's just impossible to do that. And, we'll, and the home appliances will become much more intelligent. And they, all the home appliance manufacturers, electric vehicle manufacturers, are all working on integrating this today. You'll, still, you'll start to see appliances and products. And in fact, I'm at Distributec next week, and you'll start to see those products there, and we're showing a few of them too. So we need smart energy, and so does our planet. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The average of uh, to peak in the U.S. is about 59 percent, but when you look at uh, the Far East countries like um, Taiwan and Korea and Japan, it is north of 77 percent without smart grid. So that is the result of a lot of education and awareness programs that they have offered to it's starting with uh, people who stay home and providing it through programs on television, uh, having courses in colleges. They have really improved the awareness. But with the smart grid and bringing the smart grid into the customer prem, you can imagine how much better it can get. So Far East still has 23 percentage points to go. U.S. has 41 percentage points to go. And the T&D losses that we have today in the U.S. is about 7%. We lose about 2% in transmission and 5% in distribution. If we start providing information about customer prem to distribution companies, 
and they can move to the next generation of SCADA applications, they can actually move from what we call a probabilistic planning model to an empirically based planning model, which will even further reduce losses. So it's not all due to ohmic losses or resistance on the wire. It's just not knowing exactly how much to energize all the segments at a particular time. So this kind of information from the customer prem fed back, and there was talk about that in the transmission and distribution Duke, the working group in NIST, about how you can bring that. And Nokom Markushevich of Smart Grid Operations is actively involved in that. So you can start to see that what Smart Energy Profile is doing, and Mike emphasized a lot about tailoring the consumption of energy and how it will have an economic benefit. But in addition to that, if you want to talk about grid stability for the next you know, 15, 20 years, this kind of information from customer prem is going to be very important for utilities as well as aggregators and other service providers who are providing ancillary services. So I think that's going to be good. Let's uh, bring up the chat window and see if people have posed some questions. Okay, let's scroll down and see what people were talking about. All right, so the first question we have is from Roger Levy and says, how does Smart Energy Profile 2.0 address the signal reception problems that currently limit smart meter HAN accessibility to a subset of single family premises? And you address some of that with the PLC argument. That well, I think Roger and he probably needs to clarify this. I don't know whether he means... He's thinking which, of Zigbee. Yeah, Zigbee. Yeah. So, SE1 was actually just about Zigbee. Right. SE2 is over any media, and Wi-Fi has a much better range, PLC has even better range, and so it's not restricted to one. In fact, you can cable it over Ethernet, and so you can get a pretty good range out of that. Yeah. So, uh, I think that solves that problem. I, I think the, um, there's a point behind this, which is that most of the utilities committed to a ZigBee-based HAN interface on the smart meter. So, but that does not necessarily mean that the signal has to go all the way from the smart meter to every device <coughs> in the home. The Smart Energy Profile 2.0 makes it platform independent. You could easily have an adapter 10, 15 feet away from the meter that could take the signal from the meter and put it on whatever Phi Mac layer protocol you want and carry the SCP command all the way to a coordinator or to a device at any location in the prem. So we're no longer locked down architecturally to Zigbee just because the hand interface on the smart meter is Zigbee. That's the key thing you as far as accessibility. Yes, yeah. exactly. And we, this is just we're on the beach because the aggregator market, you know, coming over the public internet through the router to some kind of coordinator <laughs> in the house can open a whole new range of applications on which Smart Energy Profile can also run. I mean, the SEP spec is not dependent on a business model. It's the platform independent specifications about the attributes of devices that are energy significant. So if you understand that those specifications have been put to say, this is what you can do with a refrigerator, this is what you can do with an air conditioner, it doesn't matter which vendor makes that product, it doesn't matter where the premise is. The specifications have become a universal descriptor. So if you're sitting in Australia or United States or China, it doesn't matter. A refrigerator will be still seen with the same syntax in any of these countries. And that's the key thing. That, that opens up new markets from a commercial perspective. Technically, it's a breakthrough because you've used international standards to uh, create the specification, but commercially this is very, very big because what it does is it allows third parties to start writing applications because they know the spec. And you can imagine, you know, people like the, the private sector people who like to build things, and we saw this with Linux and, and other things, that when you get into this kind of open space where you specify something and say it's for you to use, you can, we don't even know the applications that will be built around this. 
And I think that that's the real promise. So when we went from 1.0, which was architecturally locked down to a ZigBee protocol, to SCP 2.0, we're opening up a new commercial space. Okay, next question is from Barry, who says, hi Mike, good presentation. Many people are confused about SCP 2.0 and OpenADR 2.0. Can you share your perspective on the differences between the two? Thanks, Barry. Yep, okay. So uh, this is just my view. SEP2 um, addresses individual devices and actually has a class for every device. But um, OpenADR is more about bulk management. And as far as I can see, the utilities are aiming um, OpenADR to be sent to some of the to, to premises that might want to do fleet management where they can individually have a local management system that can decides which vehicle gets charged versus this system which is not going to really be managed by the and it's going to be completely independent of the consumer so it's down to individual load management. Yes. The next question is he says uh, Paul Baer says it's a private note to you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. it's a question. Yeah, yeah. It's a question. I'm not sure about EVs, but everything else spoken about today is achievable through SEP 1.1, 1.0. I understand the desire for IP over any physical medium, but what happens to the millions of SEP 1.1, 1.0 devices in the field that do not have remote upgrade capability? This lends to the requirement of supporting both profiles in a single ESI device. Go ahead and respond, right. and I have some points. So there, there was a PAP that was formed 18. called PAP18, which uh, came up with a, a definition of a product that actually converts SEP1 to SEP2 and allows both devices to exist. That device, we've actually built one and actually have demonstrated it, and actually we've got some sales of them. It actually allows you to attach this to a SEP1 and have both SEP1 devices and SEP2 devices coexist at the same time. Yeah. It's inexpensive though, actually pretty inexpensive, so you're surprised. Yeah, and we have examples of this in networking in times past. I mean, we had auto negotiation for Ethernet at 10 megabits and 100 megabits, and simultaneously we had that exist in the same network. You would have different LANs uh, or segments, but you could do that or even on the same shared media, it would negotiate based on the exchange. So we can do that. There was a joint study done between the NIST Cybersecurity Working Group and the NESCOR project that EPRI is leading on creating the failure scenarios as well as the <laughs> vulnerabilities associated with 1.0 and 1.x, basically, so that we knew what we were dealing with in the future when we have this environment with both 2.0 and 1.x. And essentially, the conclusion of that study was you can't really trust the information that's coming from the 1.0, 1.x environment. So you publish to it, but if things are coming, they don't have the appropriate security controls for the requirement that's coming out of NIST, you know, from their standards of what's considered secure, which 2.0 qualifies. So you basically have you can create zones, if you may, of 1.x devices in a heterogeneous environment. And you just say, if somebody talks to me from those devices, I'm not going to trust it. But I can issue, let's say, a DR signal to it. I can issue uh, load curtailment signals and so on. OK. Any other questions from the audience online? Let's uh, go around the room. Uh, any so questions? Just to extend that last one, though, if yes. you have 1.1 uh, in your meter, Five million locally. Um, oh no, they your, you don't. No, you do. That's correct. Well, so that's correct. You could. Yeah. There are pg and &E have deployed, and they've got a lot of 1.1. 1 .1, all yeah. over the country, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that's your least trusted area, but that's where your VR signals coming from. I mean, how messy does okay. it get? Okay. As I understand, the there was code space put yeah. in the smart meter. There is an 802.15.4 radio. But the code space, and that was the whole reason for making SCP 2.0 as lightweight as possible. So you think they're upgradable? No, so I do know the facts. At yeah. PAP 18, they were uncovered. So out of about the 45 million meters deployed out of the 120 million in the US, 
it's found that 17 million of those are not upgradable. Okay, 17 out of 45. But it's actually 70 million out of 120 that will be finally deployed. Yeah. So it's quite a small number. Out of those, they're probably going to have to upgrade and replace those because if you've got electric vehicles, SEP1 does not support electric vehicles. So if you've got an electric vehicle, your utility is going to have to come out and replace that. Otherwise, they can supply a little adapter that's customer installable. They don't need to truck roll it. They can just disclose that, but they can just plug in any nearby socket and it will take the SEP1 signal and turn it into a SEP2 signal. But it will not support electric vehicles. So the, the problem is definable, but you're quite right. It's a little bit of a mess. Yeah. And it, it, if you want to look, there's a nice white paper that's, if you've got an SGIP, existing, the old web Twiggy website, and go to PAC 18, you can download that white paper. It so shows you the scale of the problem, the solutions that are being proposed, and actually quite a few people are building those systems and are actually deploying them to try and do them. Yeah, and also another thing is that the touch points for the customer, that's where you've got to have the appropriate security controls. And you can also create a situation in which you logically separate the customer prem from the utility network. So in other words, you publish, but you create a file, what we would call a data diode in those situations where you have an SCP and say, you want to talk to the utility, go over the internet, <coughs> come through the front door. You can do things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's so not necessary to have a two-way There's a California the side. utility that's building not just this application layer gateway, but they're actually going to deploy the advanced SEP2 over the internet in addition to doing it over the meter. Yeah. So as I said, there were two routes into the home. And that may be cheaper than doing a truck roll to replace a meter, because a truck roll's cost. If you have a customer deployable self-installed gateway that he just connects up and connects to his ballpan and it substitutes what would that be a sub two meter. So there are <laughs> people who are working on solutions. And that's the cost of early deployment. You take the risk <laughs> of yeah. If you want to be in the front, you have to take the risks of time. Yeah. What happened to the uh, discussion between UDP and TCP for SEP 2.0? So it uses both, but TCP is basically used to transport the data. SC, uh, UDP is used to do some of the security mechanisms. Was it the TCP aspect that disqualified those 17 million meters from being upgradable to 2.0? No. No, it's just that at the end of the day when they added more and more function sets and they increased the security layers and they added zero configuration that it became bigger okay, than so memory the footprint. cumulative effect. The cumulative effect. Okay. You couldn't point to any one thing. Okay. They tried to that there was several solutions that tried to use other mechanisms, but they didn't solve the problem anyway, so those mechanisms weren't adopted. Think of questions while I read this next one from Mike Thompson, who says, so what inexpensive device should I look for to trial this at home in PG&E's territory? P.S. I have the Toyota RAV4 EV and Nissan Leaf EVs at home. <laughs> and solar generation resources on the roof. He's accessorized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got everything. I, uh, he needs to be featured on San Jose Mercury News in the science section. So, I don't know if PG are going to do it, but you need to sign up. I, I know in sdg and &E territory, there are volunteers already offering to trial these sort of things. Um, and I think sdg and &E is, is taking that lead there and I think PG and will follow so you've got to keep your eyes open until the end of the year. I would say the end of the year. But. And you have some kind of a workshop in your garage also, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Yeah, speaking of. Uh, okay, we'll start with you and then Rebecca, then Angela. Uh, Mike, speaking of the technical challenges, you said the footprint was very important. Can you say how much it is? So everybody has their different implementation, so it's all been done on, on a relative nature. But grid to homes, and it really depends on the device. So if you understand, there are different devices, and they all have different functionality. But if you look at two different classes of devices, a small device like a thermostat or something that may just control a pool pump, it's just going to look at demand response events. It's probably 128k flash and 32k RAM. 
if you want a full-blown one that may be managing different things and is much more sophisticated looking at pricing, demand response, DER functionality, um, you're probably talking about 256K of flash and 64K of RAM. So it can vary depending on capability. You have to understand that set two is very modularized and that there are 15 different function sets and it doesn't, set two doesn't define the devices and devices can select which function sets they want to use. So you really have to look, if you want the whiz bang one, you want a lot more, 256K and 64K RAM. As far as the processor is concerned, it's mostly it is on processor? But no. I mean, it's up to the implementation. I mean, we have done every processor out there, and there is no power processor is really required. It's hard to do an 8-bit one, not because it's an 8-bit processor and it runs at low speed, it's because it's got page memory or something. But it, it's possible to put SEP2 on just about any device. The number of MIPS it uses is very, very low. I can tell you the average data speed is 10 kilobits per second. You're not processing an awful lot of data. The data is very efficiently sent. You don't send a lot of it. It's not done over. Right, and in fact, the intervals are probably every 15 minutes you may wake up and do something and go back to sleep. I mean, it's it's very low uh, MIPS intensive. Um, it's sophisticated in that it can do a lot of functionality, but it really doesn't need a lot of power. We have a few minutes left, so I'd like to see if there are other questions. Rebecca, yeah, you had a question? Sure. Um, kind of a general technical question. But So if I buy a home energy management system off the shelf, mm -hmm. um, and say I live in an apartment building and there's a bank of meters, how does my team system know which one to talk to? So this is a problem that yeah. people are trialing to prove how to make this work. So mm -hmm. I know I'm involved in some of the trials that are going on, but they're using what they're calling a range extending um, PLC. Your meter may be Zigbee, they're converting Zigbee to power line. Because you're connected power line wise to your premise, they've mm -hmm. then got a device in your premise to take the power line and produces Zigbee again. And so what it does, it makes you your apartment think that it's actually physically not next to the meter. That's what it does. Similar to the electrical vehicle problem. Similar to the electric vehicle problem, yes, in that you've got a, you actually because your meter is the power going uh -huh. to your premise, it's going to use that route, and PLC can go many miles, by the way, in some cases. But what it has to do is, your meter's probably Zigbee, it needs to bridge to power line, it needs to travel up your cable, mm -hmm. it needs to convert back to Zigbee with a device inside your home, and then it's called a range extender. Yeah. So, in whenever you use PLC, you got to have the higher layer security controls, because essentially it's broadcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all the interconnectedness of electrical wires, the signal goes everywhere. It doesn't know where to stop until you have a device that authenticates you and says, okay, okay. who are you? Why are you talking to me? Uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of guidance the way an Ethernet cable does mm -hmm. because of the interconnectedness of all the electrical wires in the house uh, on a single phase. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, and there is a concept of a unique ID. You know, the electric vehicle will have a unique ID. So when PG&E or any utility will sign you up, they will know what that unique ID of your vehicle is going to be. So you get authenticated with the meter so that the appropriate charging, because in the future we may have a different rate for charging electric vehicles than other things in the house, yeah. especially if they want to incent you to go green. So then you would have to have submetering. You can't just use the home meter then to do that. Uh, eventually, the idea is even putting it on the vehicle itself. Today, we don't have that, but I think we're headed that way. Right, Chris? It's being talked about. It's yeah. probably the best way to put it. <laughs> yeah, because then you can use OnStar and other ways also of getting there. Right. I had a question that, that kind of was the, the, the next step beyond the electrical vehicle one, which is Okay, I, I buy a Nissan Leaf, I plug it in every night, I drive it every day, and I take it to my brother's house in L.A. Mm -hmm. Well, now, all of a sudden, I'm plugging it into some place that doesn't know I previously existed there. So, how does, presumably, SCE... It's not SCE, it's your brother. So to register any device, like electric vehicle or even a thermostat, you have to go onto the you'll have to go onto the utility's website and put in its unique ID. That unique unique ID is going to be in your little card, just like your radio right. code. It's called the SFDI. Actually, it's the hash of the certificate. It's eleven digits of the hash of the certificate. So your brother's going to have to put that in. 
and you'll probably have to pay him a six pack because he's going to have that charge to his bill well, today. Be because it'll be something similar. Yeah, yeah. but uh -huh. but uh, today there is no free charge. There's no roaming. There's no. Um, but there are a lot of talk about it. But it's yeah. it's way way out there. Roaming is the ability to go and plug into someone else's meter and get it charged back to your home and not have him charged. So, so one bar to the adoption of electric vehicles is not only the the lack of rage; it's the inability to plug into any convenient station, charging station, once you are beyond the scope of your particular utility. So what we need in addition to a charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. And that's not quite true. Let, let me explain to you how this happens. If if you are not found to be registered at your brother's of premise, by the way, he can and it's inside his garage, so he's actually in within the boundaries of his home, his E V E C could be programmed to give you a charge. However, if you are given a special rate by your utility and it isn't you aren't registered for that rate, you are going to get the full charges if it's charged by the home rate, by the way. So there is a fallback mm -hmm. um, based on that. So there is the ability to go and charge any place. The spec says even if you don't communicate, you are going to get a charge. It's just that you may not get any incentives based on that charge. Right. Okay. When you go to a public station, that's, that's totally different because you'll be metered through other methods like credit cards and they, they'll ignore that communication yeah. anyway, they'll just give the charge so based on how much your swipe will dangle in front of them. One possibility can be a smart token or a smart card, like we have Fast Track right. and things like that, which you can go to a mall or a kiosk or go online and charge it on your card. And then wherever you are, you could have a device where you can put it if you're at your uncle's house or your brother's house and it'll deduct based on the rate there off of your card but won't charge the customer prem. And I know IBM is involved in creating financial and and yes. uh, workflow processes for such architectures. They're, they're, they're going a little beyond that. They're actually creating the architectures themselves. Okay, yes. So uh, it yeah. works uh, with prepay. It works wonderfully. Uh, Salt River Project in Arizona mm -hmm. uses this with a lot of credit challenge people, and then even wealthy people are now making <laughs> moving to that prepay program to teach their kids. And you're right about the five to fifteen percent because that Prius effect has a twelve and a half percent effect on the consumption. So the people who are on the prepay program, on average, use twelve and a half percent less electricity than the ambient population. Just by knowing, because prepay, part of it is knowing how many kilowatt hours you're using and not having to go outside the house and looking at the disk going around or little numbers. A any other questions? Angela, you had a question. Yes. What about SEP, if anything, supports the concept of demand limiting um, at the premise level or even at the device level, let's say different levels of charge? Mm -hmm. of uh, EDSC that physically can be done and then SEP supporting the, the concept of multi-level or even demand limiting. So that there's there's two function function sets in um, SCP2. One is called flow reservation and it's actually the car makes a request about how much power it, it wants and when and for how long, in other words its rate. And the response will come back to the utility and you can reduce that. In other words, I want five kilowatts at one kilowatt an hour starting at 11 p.m. That can be a request over the set. The utility might respond saying, no, but you can have that at half the rate you wanted. So that, that's one. That's a simple function set. The other one is a DER function set that is, is the, almost the opposite of demand response in that, well, it's really the DER is actually used power flow the other direction. Um, and then there's what's called DRLC, which is demand response load control, that you can, the utility can uh, tell you to go to a percentage of your normal load. So it could say to you, I want you to go to 40% 40, 40 of your load. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to reduce your load to 40% of what it was. That can be done by the EVC or it can be told to the electric vehicle to do so. Okay. And the other question was, which version of SCP, if any, supports the concept of prioritization of loads within the premise? Different relative orders of priority 
at the individual mm -hmm. level. So, so, um, I don't think that. I mean, the prioritisation is is not set by the home. It's actually, you could you could set the utility could set it up to be applied to, and and send a signal down to say. Uh, it's not prioritization, but it could actually send a command to the, to the thermostats to do this first, and then if it doesn't get it, it could send another command to the pool pumps to do that, and then it could send another command to the appliances to do that. So it's not really a prioritization, but it could be programmed to have a escalation, if you like. Uh, I'll do this, and if I don't get enough load reduction, I'll do that. If I don't get enough load reduction, I'll get to that. So it really isn't a prioritization, it's more of a a procedure that the back office would have to do by sending down the right signals to the right devices. Yeah, we have a couple of questions online. I wanted to, because they've been there for a while, and we need to wrap up. So keep your question in mind. And the question is, uh, oh, I, it moved a little. But uh, it was asking about submetering and SCP 2.0. Uh, and say, can you, yeah, can you comment briefly about submetering and SEP? And then the other one was, can you talk about submeter applications and what the device profiles look like, accuracy, certification, data transport, leading to subtractive billing? So there's nothing in SEP that says what the accuracy has to be. It's just, it's just a means of transporting information. But there is a submeter function set that's supported by it that allows the devices in the or and the utility to understand what the power consumption is from that submeter and have it mirrored to the main ESI where the main ESI can perform a, um, a subtractive billings order. So um, the system's there. It has nothing to do with certification. It doesn't set to doesn't say anything about that at all or um, accuracy. How how is this information carried back over the AMI system? Are there some tables in the NCC twelve nineteen where this information will be parked? I mean, how it, will it, it could be, be carried? But a lot of utilities are actually choosing to use SEP to to go to a back office server. Oh, over the internet. Over the internet. So oh, actually, okay. they're going to the ESI and then they're sending that same data back over SEP2. Doesn't mean to say you have to do that. You can implement your proprietary system to do that. Okay. But it actually makes it easy because the same data has been transferred to the ESI has been transferred to the back office. So a lot of them are choosing to do that, which makes it very simple because you can cascade servers and clients all the way down. So, for instance, an EBSC could be a server to an electric vehicle. Hmm. The ESI is a is a client to the server in the ESI. The ESI to the back office is a client to the back office server. Right. What you're doing, you're cascading client and servers. Yeah, because you have to be very careful about loading the AMI network, which is a mesh network, which primary job really is to send signals, read meters, remote connect, disconnect. You don't want to put too much burden from the home area network on it. So you got to be very intelligent about what you pick and carry back on yeah. that network. And everything can be asynchronous. And it could be, it can be sent when the utility chooses to retrieve it, exactly. rather than just being sent. Continuous, there's no, there's yeah. no response required, immediate response required. So you can actually put in a large log, and once a month, someone could go and empty that log to find out how many of those smart, smart thermostats uh, did something in case they have to lose their review. You don't right. have to send it back straight away. All right. So the next. Oh wow. Now they're they're gonna, gonna, oh, they, it went up. Or, no, th these are the questions yeah. at the end. Yeah. So we answered the submeter and SEP. configuration. Yeah. In regard to zero device configuring, this can't entirely be true as a user has to report the EUI and install code to the utility so the end device can be authenticated by the electric meter at the application layer authentication. So there's no device configuration. What the user's doing is, is actually going to the website and taking the number off the bottom of the package and saying, this device belongs to me but he's not configured Config. his device. So it doesn't require any keyboard or display on any device. All it requires is for him Data to entry. enter it in to say this device belongs to me. Otherwise, you may be closer to your neighbor's smart meter or gateway, okay. and you, you're not registering to him, you're registering to you. So somehow they have to do that. But there's no device configuration. So there is zero com device configuration. Yes, I call that the state farm protocol, like a good neighbor. <laughs> All right. 
Next question. <laughs> How do you propose to roll out SEP 2.0 devices in a utility that only has SEP 1.0 infrastructure? The only way to do that is to use this ALG that we just talked about earlier. So an ALG is in PAP18, there's a white paper you can download at the SGIP site that actually details how to do that. And if you can't find it, just send me a note and I'll provide it. Okay, next question. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, um, how quickly do you think this type of functionality will begin to be rolled out to the customer months? I guess you said end of 2013? So, the, the we certify products available probably in the next quarter. When they roll out, I've got no control over the market whatsoever, and it'll probably go play in markets where they have the urgent need to solve the problems. You, have they got an energy you know, problem? Um, have they got a peaking problem? They'll probably actually want to see that out by doing something themselves. I, I don't know. I think it's going to be years personally, but you know, if we have to save, even if we have to save 1% a year, you don't need to get that many devices out every year. It'll take 100 years to do 1% 1, one a year, but 1% is still quite a large quantity, so. Right, and this next question is, is critical because this is, relates to that mesh protocol that I'm talking about with very low effective throughput. It's sufficient to read meters and do that, but when you're talking about the the DR, you know, for load shedding, how do you quickly <coughs> fit on a slow communicating infrastructure? And that's where you're talking about other pipes like internet and, and yeah. other ways. Yeah, but, but I think it's actually pointed to set one infrastructure, not the yeah. AMI infrastructure. That, that's a mesh next technology. Yeah. But, you know, if you did it over Wi-Fi, it's going to be instantaneous, or you did it over PLC, it's instantaneous. And um, set one was a little bit bur more of a burdensome protocol, and it was linked to only, it was only being able to use Zigbee, which is a mesh technology, and the effective rate of that was like 30 kilobits per second. Yes. But you um, also mentioned that 10 kilobits per second is sufficient for doing yeah, yeah, average. But, but an average rate. You'll yeah. have these peaks that go up, but they'll last yeah. for a short little blip and then they'll go back down again. Right. But um, I think if it's done over Wi-Fi, I mean, uh, the results we've seen over Wi-Fi, you blink your eye and it's done. So. Okay, and then we have one last question from Shushan. So basically, it's regarding the submetering. Like, does the time of use rate plan work with submetering? Like, the main mm -hmm. challenge would be like the computations would really increase every time the rate plan changes every day. Like, yeah, you could yeah. actually do real time pricing with set two. Okay. Um, um, a device. I'm going through the technical details, but a device itself can subscribe to a uh, pricing table. And that pricing table, the server will look at it, and if it changes, it'll send a signal to that device that the price has just changed instantaneously. So you don't need to be there continuously trying to find out what the pricing has changed. Yeah. So the subscription method is what's used. The one disadvantage with the subscription method, by the way, is very hard to make it work on battery-operated devices. The reason is, when it goes to tell you that it's changed, if you're not awake to receive that signal, and a battery-operated device could go to sleep, you're not going to get it. Yeah. But a battery operated device, what it does normally, it goes to sleep, wakes up, does a media poll to see if the price has changed and goes back down to sleep. That's normally what a polling system. But a, a mains power device can just sit there and say, tell me when the price has changed and it will get an instant message saying the price has changed. Okay. okay. And one more challenge would be the synchronization of the time between all the devices. Yes. So is there there a is a very sophisticated time okay. signal that's sent out and with the offsets and all sorts of things. Also, by the way, utilities do want to put a randomization on some of these events. So the, the time doesn't have to be that accurate. In fact, they would like it to be not so accurate. And actually, they randomize some of these events and tell you to offset your off or your on times by a random time. And it may be a random time over five minutes, so you come back on in a five minute period, you go off in a five minute period. The reason is that you don't want major spikes. They don't want loads changing on or loads changing off or at the same time. So they actually, actually, but the, the, the timing is a quite an interesting thing. There's a time function there. It's got like quality, it's got offsets, it's got, you can actually calculate differences and all sorts of things. It's interesting. All right. In order to maintain the marital status of the IBM personnel who are hosting us here today, I'm going to bring this seminar to a close, and I really thank IBM for hosting this event. I thank all of you for taking the time uh, to 
come and visit us here today and of course to all those people online. I am going to now at this point turn off the recording, but before we do that, uh, there is uh, the name and position and company affiliation of Mike Borton. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. Do you have an email address that you put on the presentation? No, I didn't, but I should have done. Okay. It's mborton at gridtohome.com. Yeah. <laughs> so feel free to reach out to him and ask him more technical questions. And I'm really, really happy that we had you here because, you know, the buck really stops with you on SCP 2.0. And I mean, not not from a bureaucratic perspective, but from a technical perspective. You know it, you've developed firmware on it, and you have commercialized it, and you've successfully sold it in multiple institutions. And we're very proud of your entrepreneurship. So, And I've seen you do this from 2009 onwards. So I'm really, really a round of applause to you. All right, so with that clap, we're going to turn off the recording, and you all have a very good night out there in cyber world. <laughs>